we're going to look at some operational controls and, and things that you can do to operate the coagulation and flocculation system. And the first piece of equipment we'll look at is the streaming current meter. The streaming current meter measures the electrical charge of the water. This is that zeta potential that we were talking about. And as we said before, most particles in water are anionic, which means they carry a negative charge, and that's the zeta potential. The zeta potential is the difference between a particle's charge and the water surrounding it, and the units for zeta potential are millivolts. As zeta potential approaches zero, the particles will stop repelling one another and begin to clump together. And we've already illustrated this earlier in this lesson. So we want the zeta potential to approach zero, or the magnitude of the negative charge to get smaller and smaller, so that we can have this flocculation occur. Most plants run slightly negative, and that's because you don't want to overdose your coagulant, because that can cause water quality issues in the distribution system. Another way to operate the coagulation process is what's called enhanced coagulation, and that's designed to maximize organic matter removal and to reduce disinfection byproduct precursors, uh, specifically trihalomethanes, because trihalomethanes form when chlorine reacts with the organic matter that's in the water. Well, how do we accomplish this enhanced coagulation? Well, we do that primarily by reducing the pH to an optimum pH range. And for aluminum sulfate, that optimum or enhanced pH range is 5.5 to 7.0. Now, aluminum sulfate can be used over a wide range, you know, up to 8.5 pH. However, if we want to enhance the coagulation and get better organic material removal, we'll operate uh, somewhere below 7 pH units. For ferric sulfate, that range is even lower. It's 4.0 to 6.2. Well, if you understand corrosion chemistry, if you discharge water to the distribution system uh, that has a low pH, that's, that water is going to be very corrosive. So you can see here why aluminum sulfate is a more popular or more commonly used coagulant because it its effective range is not as low in the pH range as ferric sulfate. Well, why does this work? Well, humic and fulvic molecules stay together at a lower pH. Now, these humic and ful fulvic molecules, uh, those are the natural organic uh, or decaying uh, organic material that's in surface water supplies. So at a lower pH, they tend to stay together. So that helps with the flocculation. The coagulant demand goes down as these compounds stay together and flocculation is improved as molecules stay together. And the acid addition, because that's how we lower the pH, we'll add uh, typically sulfuric acid uh, to lower the pH. Well that acid addition preconditions the organic compounds and helps the flocculation process. Well there's several reasons. One is to optimize the coagulant dose. And this is done for the purpose of treating water at the lowest possible cost, but also for the best uh, coagulation and flocculation for maximum uh, material removal. Jar testing can also be used to determine the optimum pH for the coagulation process, and it'll help us determine how much acid we need to add during the enhanced coagulation process. Jar testing will also show us if we need to add alkalinity. And as I said before, aluminum sulfate and ferrous sulfate, or excuse me, ferric sulfate, require alkalinity in the source water in order for it to effectively coagulate and flocculate. So the jar test can show us what adding alkalinity in will do to flock formation and settleability and filterability of that flock. When doing a jar test, uh, say we want to determine our alum dose. Well, what we would do is we would select different doses for each of these jars. For example, 
we might have our first jar at 14 milligrams per liter of alum. The next one might be 18 milligrams per liter, then 22 milligrams per liter, and 26 milligrams per liter. What we'll do is we'll add our different coagulant doses and then let this uh, jar test machine put different mixing energies at different time intervals on the jars to simulate the flash mix and the three stages of flocculation and then the the mixers will stop and you'll allow the flock to settle and then you'll pull water off and run a turbidity and see which dose actually gave you the best coagulation, flocculation, and settling to produce the lowest turbidity. And that's one way that a jar test can be used to help determine your alum dose. It can also be used to help determine your polymer dose. So say we determined that uh, we had an alum dose of 22 milligrams per liter, that's ideal. Well, we'll take some raw water, put it in this each of these jars, We'll dose each of these jars to 22 milligrams per liter with alum, and then we'll add one milligram per liter of polymer to the first jar, 1.2 milligrams per liter to the next, 1.4 milligrams to the next, and 1.6 milligrams per liter to the next jar. We'll then repeat the process and see which combination of alum and polymer gives us the best results. Now something worth noting is that the amount of polymer added, or the amount of polyelectrolyte, is significantly lower than the amount of alum, which is true of other uh, metal salts, such as all your ferric coagulants and your aluminum coagulants. You'll add at least a magnitude uh, of 10 higher of your metal salts than you will the polyelectrolytes. So you want to remember that for your exam, that polyelectrolytes, uh, very little goes a long way. So you want to remember that when dosing polyelectrolytes or polymers, a little bit goes a long way. Well, what are the factors that impact coagulation and flocculation? Well, water temperature uh, will impact it. Cold water negatively impacts uh, the process because chemical reactions occur more slowly and the water is more dense so it's just harder for uh, the flock to move through colder water than warmer water. Also alkalinity. Al low alkalinity negatively impacts the aluminum sulfate and ferric sulfate processes because both of those require alkalinity to react and form the aluminum hydroxide and the ferric hydroxide flock that then attracts the negative colloids in the water. Um, low turbidity also negatively impacts the coagulation and flocculation process. Higher turbidity water is easier to coagulate and flocculate. Um, pH uh, impacts some coagulants more so than others. Alum is definitely impacted the most by pH and mixing energy will impact the process. If your mixing energy is too low, you'll have poor flock formation, but if it's too high, it'll cause flock shear or cause the flock to break apart. So an operator has to control the mixing energy in each flocculation chamber so that you get good flock formation, yet you're not tearing your flock apart. Um, the dose is important as well. If you don't have sufficient uh, coagulant, you're going to get insufficient coagulation. If your coagulant dose is too high, you can end up with colored water. For example, too much alum will cause a bluish or a milky colored water to be discharged into the distribution system, as where too much ferric or iron-based coagulant can cause the water to be yellow. Uh, that's delivered to the customers. So if you overdose your coagulant, you can end up with colored water. And then flocculant aid, uh, the addition of polymer can aid flocculation and settling. So the addition of polyelectrolytes or polymers will improve the coagulation and flocculation process. Well, what are the operator actions if there is a change in the source water? Well, the operator needs to determine the extent of the change in the source water and this will be accomplished through lab testing. 
it needs to evaluate the source water quality by running a series of lab tests on the water to determine the mineral concentration, the pH, the alkalinity of the source water. Then oftentimes a jar test will be required to determine if a change in the coagulant dose is required. So jar testing is very effective uh, at uh, compensating for changes in source water. The operator should also verify uh, equipment performance and make appropriate process changes. And then once those process changes are made, the operator must verify plant response. What are the potential process changes that an operator might make? Well, he might change the coagulant or, or mix, whether it's a polyelectrolyte or uh, metal-based uh, coagulant. Maybe a change in the coagulant dose is required because of the change in the source water. Or maybe the flash mix intensity isn't sufficient. So maybe there's a required adjustment in that coagulant flash mix. Or maybe a filter aid needs to be added or a coagulant aid needs to be added. Or it's possible that the change in source water uh, was an a increase in pH or uh, so maybe pH needs to be lowered or maybe there's insufficient alkalinity and you need to add alkalinity to the water so that proper coagulation and flocculation can occur. So th these are the different things that an operator needs to take into account when there's a change in the source water and different actions that he or she might take and potential process changes uh, that can be made with the coagulation and flocculation process. So if you have a change in the coagulation process results, uh, similar operator actions are required. You're going to evaluate the source water quality. You'll perform a jar test if required. You'll verify that your equipment is performing properly and then make any changes as appropriate. And then as always, you want to verify plant response when you've made a change. And potential process changes if your coagulation process isn't working properly. You might change the coagulant, your dose, adjust your flash mix intensity, add coagulant or a filter aid, or adjust the alkalinity or pH. So again, these actions are very uh, similar in both circumstances.